Chocolate Masters Hangout. Today we're going to be talking about choosing fine chocolate. My name is Alicia Krupp from Ecole Chocolat and today we welcome Jessica Ferrero of Bar Cacao and Megan Giller of Chocolate Noise and Igrani Yu, uh, the uh, author of the Chocolate Tasting Kit and also um, of the Well-Tempered Chocolatier. So today we're going to be talking about how to choose fine chocolate. The holidays are upon us. Halloween is next week, um, and then we have the winter holidays, Valentine's Day, before we know it, we'll be moving into Easter. So it's really a season where chocolate is a central part of holiday gift giving. And chocolate makers and chocolatiers create flavorful chocolate bars and bonbons, uh, visually beautiful pieces of edible art for us to share with our friends and family. So how do you know which chocolate to choose for your holiday gift giving. We're so lucky because we have three panelists with us today who are in the business of identifying and choosing fine chocolate, all from different perspectives. They've really worked to train their palates to truly understand what makes a fine flavor chocolate. And they also understand the high level of craftsmanship needed to produce the perfect chocolate bar or bonbon. So we wanted to start off our conversation with an important distinction, which is the difference between a chocolatier and a chocolate maker, because uh, these professionals have very different skill sets. Um, so chocolate makers manufacture chocolate from dried cacao using specific equipment, such as a roaster, grinder, refiner mill, conch, and a tempering machine. And each step of the process really influences the final flavor. Their finished product is pure chocolate, usually in bar form. Chocolatiers, on the other hand, source and blend that pure chocolate made by chocolate makers for specific properties and flavor profiles. And then they use that to develop their recipes for their own unique bonbons, confections, and bars. So in using the term bonbon, we mean filled chocolates, whether they're dipped in chocolate um, or molded, and it includes things like truffles, caramels, creams, pralines, all the delicious things that we all like to eat. So now let's get to our discussion. Uh, we're going to start by having our panelists introduce themselves and tell us a bit more about their roles and their chocolate expertise. So we're going to start with, Je with Jessica. Could you tell us a bit about Bar Cacao? Sure, yeah. I think uh, the easiest thing to do is to explain Bar Cacao's mission as opposed to what it does because Bar Cacao is me and my mission is to drive the craft chocolate movement in a positive direction. Um, and I do that by supporting uh, chocolate makers and educating and advising the public and uh, specialty shops and retailers that are interested in, as I like to say, raising their bar. Um, yeah, and I do that in a lot of ways. I do a lot of fun events. I sell chocolate. Um, I do tastings and uh, lectures and advise chocolate makers. And um, yeah, that's that's the tip of the iceberg, anyways. Perfect. Um, and so, Megan, can you tell us a bit about your work in chocolate and your current project, Chocolate Noise? Yeah, so I'm a food writer, um, and I specialize in craft chocolate, and I write for places like Slate and Food and Wine and Travel and Leisure. And then just recently in June, I started a project called Chocolate Noise, which is a website where I tell the stories of the best bean to bar makers in the country. And so it's instead of like a top ten list or something like that, it's a one story a month, an in-depth story about a different maker. Like I think so far I've done Rogue, Askinosi, Taza, Dandelion, and Soma. And you really get to hear um, kind of their story, how they started making chocolate, what they specialize in, and something unique about that maker. So you get a sense of them other than just the, the bar, their bar on the shelf. You've done a really great job of really drawing out um, their stories and their personalities. It's a really interesting series for anyone that hasn't had a chance to read it yet. Um, Igrani, could you tell us about your background in chocolate? Sure. Um, I, I started as a chemist um, and uh, moved into the food world, so I became a prof uh, professional pastry chef and chocolatier. Um, and now I am primarily a writer. So like Megan, I'm a freelance uh, food and travel writer. I'm the author of the Chocolate Tasting Kit. 
uh, which is your guide to selecting, tasting, and appreciating chocolate. Um, and I'm also a chocolate educator, so I teach uh, classes to consumers on how to taste chocolate and, why, and uh, how to appreciate it, uh, as well as some corporate consulting. Um, and just generally trying to get the word out about uh, fine chocolate um, and, and why it's awesome. Um, I'm also a frequent chocolate judge, um, so I get the really onerous task of tasting chocolate um, and judging it, um, which is uh, I'm harder than it sounds, um, but I'm not expecting anyone to cry any tears for me. <laughs> <laughs> I can sympathize. I can sympathize too. It is, you know, I mean, if you have to eat 70 pieces of chocolate in one day, you, you maybe don't feel so great after yeah. that. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it, is, it, is, it, is, it is an excellent job at the same time. <laughs> so thank you everyone for those introductions. Now we all know that we're in excellent hands for our conversation. Um, so let's move on now to talking about craft chocolate bars and chocolate that's made by chocolate makers. So, Jessica, you specialize in curating chocolate bars for your business. What are the main differences between a craft chocolate bar and a mass market chocolate bar? Mm, pretty much everything. Um, well, I, I, I get asked this question a lot, and, and it, it's surprising that, you know, um, it's, it's a little hard to nail down in, you know, in terms of, like, exactly what you can look for. Um, but um, I have noticed that, in what I look for, I look for simple ingredients. Um, there's often a two-ingredient ethic of just cacao and sugar, and my joke is one is optional. But there are definitely other ingredients that are appropriate given um, given a chocolate maker's style. You know, added cocoa butter or vanilla. Um, certain additives I'm not a fan of. I don't enjoy lecithin myself, and I don't believe that. Um, it's necessary, and I think that a lot of people, uh, a lot of makers in the craft chocolate movement. Um, I, you're hard pressed to find a craft chocolate maker who's using lecithin. But beyond the ingredients, I think it, it's really about the flavor and um, kind of the the personality of the maker that you're you're kind of connecting with. So it's not necessarily about labels or something really specific. You may see things like craft chocolate and single origin and small batch, and those can be indicators um, and the percentage. You know, these are all indicators. Um, but what I look for is, is really how it tastes. Um, you know, I look for something that, that has a clear, makers that have a clear point of view. Um, for example, uh, an easy example is Ritual. I've kind of dialed it into my, my lingo for them is bold, bright, and balanced. And that's really their point of view and what they do. They do that also with a really beautiful, smooth texture with just two ingredients. Um, and, right. I, you know, I think that it's kind of like getting to know a person when you get to know a chocolate maker. Their chocolate should express who they are and what they're about. Um, yeah. And it should be a little you... enjoy. Sorry. Um, yeah, I think people really notice a difference in terms of the depth of flavor when you're having, you know, a craft chocolate bar versus a mass market chocolate bar. There's just so much more there in terms of the flavor and and um, what you experience when you eat it. Um, when you first began tasting fine flavor chocolate, what struck you most in comparison to mass market bars? Um, my I, I was I first began with a Bonat bar, which was kind of the case with the number of people. Um, in 2007, there weren't there there really wasn't a craft chocolate there wasn't a craft chocolate movement. It was just in its early kind of stages of getting started. But for me, I think that, um, I, I don't know, it just was kind of love at first sight. Maybe I had never really had a chocolate bar that was um, of such a high percentage even. I'm not even, I'm not even sure of that when I look back. No, that's probably not true. But it, there was something about the texture and the intensity um, and the low level, level of bitterness, I think. Um, and also, it, and it just kind of really was very soothing and, and special. It was a special moment. I fell in love. It was love at first sight. That's always kind of what I say about, about that moment. Um, yeah. And I realized it was something that I could explore. It was an affordable luxury for me at the time. And, you know, I realized that I could pick up anything that I wanted and just, just kind of explore and have my way with it. So right. that's kind of part of what got me off and running. 
Right. And so as you as you mentioned, we've really seen massive growth in the United States in the number of chocolate makers um, in the past 10 years particularly. So um, you touched on this a little bit, but for the average person who might be used to buying a chocolate bar at the convenience store, the world of craft chocolate makers can be a bit daunting and a bit confusing even. You know, the packages are covered in words like single origin, 70% cocoa, small batch, handmade. Um, you know, what advice would you give about sort of sorting out the information on labels? Um, you know, at this stage of the game, it's part of the fun to go beyond the labels. Um, and I think that that's, that that's where we are right now. You know, um, if you're lucky enough to live in a city like San Francisco, you can go into Dandelion and taste for yourself and look around and, and learn all about it in one fell swoop. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it is hard when you're at a grocery store. You may not, may or may not even find craft chocolate at, at a grocery store, depending on where you are. Mm -hmm. um, so, because we're kind of in these early stages, you know, labels aren't necessarily verbiage on a bar isn't necessarily isn't necessarily an indicator of anything. Some people look to the awards, you know, to help guide them. Some people look to my website, you know, I've got a list of makers that I really enjoy and appreciate. You know, you can look to media, all of the work that we do. Um, if if people are kind of nervous about, you know, that that barrier of, of paying a, a different price level, um, you know, I'm not a fan of kind of the sticker labels. You know, I personally am not a fan of fair trade. Um, and, um, you know, so it, it gets really complicated, but um, I think you should be drawn into to something that appeals to you and just plain be willing to give it a go or look to resources uh, that are out there um, to get started and ask around. It's really part of the fun for me, I think. Right. It is a bit of an experimenting process in terms of, you know, learning what you like. You know, do you like a higher percentage? Do you like, you know, chocolate from Costa Rica as opposed to chocolate from Ecuador? Or, And it really is in the tasting that I think you kind of start to learn that, um, what your preferences are. Um, and so you touched on this a little bit, but for some consumers, the idea of spending um, $10, $20 or even more on a single bar of chocolate seems completely foreign when they're used to spending $1.99. So what would you say to people who um, would bulk maybe at the higher price point for fine flavored chocolate? I should they say they should be balking at the low price point of a $1.99 chocolate bar. That's really where I would start with that. That, you know, really that's, that's, that's not something that is viable anymore. You know, it really isn't, you know, uh, and that's why you started seeing these articles about, you know, a chocolate shortage because farmers are walking away. They're not making enough to support themselves. They're walking, they're pulling out their cocoa trees and pulling other products. Um, so the whole process needs to be supported in a different way. Whether or not that will happen with the industrial product, I don't know, but it's, it's a $1.99 chocolate bar isn't particularly viable. Um, and then on the other hand, so getting beyond that basic core message, which I think is really important, is the fact that, you know, for people who are in that position, and, you know, I'm very careful with my money, you know, um, it, it's that you can kind of look at it as, you know, if, if you taste it versus eating it. A, a bar goes along, can go a really long way, you know, there's, there's kind of an expression of savoring slowly. So mm -hmm. you may buy, you may buy a $10 bar, but, um, you know, a $1.99 bar, I think most people are hard-pressed to, like, you know, have a bite and put it away. You know, they scarf it down. It's, 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 it's candy. It's junk. It's, it's a snack. Right. It's what you call it like that. And most people find that, you know, if you, if you have some nice chocolate, you have a square. You have a good square. If you take a moment, you know, you're kind of like, whoa, that was really nice. I'm good. You can save it for later. You, you value it more. And I think you should value your food in general. And specifically, this is a great example of when and how to value your food. Right. And so what advice would you give to people who are shopping for chocolate to give as a gift this holiday season? What are some indicators of quality that people should look for? Indicators of quality. Well, I mean, I, I have a list of makers that I really enjoy working with. Um, as I mentioned earlier, indicators of quality can mean certain origins. I mean, you can you can mess up chocolate at any point along the line. So there's nothing you can beyond tasting and exploring and getting in there and, and finding out for yourself what you like. Nothing's going to really replace that. 
But um, that said, you know, you can look to um, a clear vision from a chocolate maker, single origin percentages, and in terms of the holidays, I mean, just kind of, you know, once you have a sense of what makers um, you appreciate, see if they're doing anything for the holidays. So some makers, in terms of the holidays, some makers are doing, are at the level where they can, they have the bandwidth to create products specifically for the holidays, like uh, guys at Dick Taylor sent me, this isn't even ready yet, but it's it's a peppermint drinking chocolate. Um, so um, this is just kind of a mock-up prototype. But um, this is going to be a lot of fun for the holidays, and it kind of isn't a, you know, you stuff, stuff it in the stocking, perfect stocking stuffer. Um, right. Asking those who does peppermint bark. Um, but... If there, some makers are less established, and sometimes that can be just really fun that you, you're giving something like maybe Paulette Devine, right, where she makes a few hundred bars a week. And if you can get your hands on them, you can see that this is just, you know, just a really nice package and a nice gift in and of itself because it's small and it's, it's handcrafted and specially made. Some makers right. are doing limited release bars and pretty packaging. Right. Um, so it's there's true. lots That's of really kind of... Like that, but. Yeah, that's a really good point because some people maybe wouldn't think about giving just a chocolate bar as a gift, but a lot of the packaging is really beautiful and it just sort of makes it feel that little bit extra special when you're giving it to someone as a gift, which is which is really yeah, nice. Yeah, and to take it to the next level, and of course, I mean, I love Granny's taste, chocolate tasting kit. I'm bummed that mine's in, in San Francisco and I'm in L.A., but there's actually even space in the bottom of it where you can put chocolate bars, and I think yeah. it's really fun to kind of put together your own tasting kit Absolutely. You know, um, a handful of special bars. Maybe they're from one maker. Maybe they're from one origin. Or maybe it's just you know kind of what you thought looked pretty and go together and have a chocolate tasting party. Or, or um, I, I think that you know, of course, this is my point of view. I don't really look to kind of confections and, and those kinds of things. But um, chocolate tasting kits are great. You know, they're these little. These little. They're they're, they're kind of cute. Little thirty three bars of chocolate notebooks, and you kind of keep track of what you liked and what you don't. Um, it's a kind of another variation on uh, not a chocolate tasting kit like the Garney has, which is really cool. But um, right. there's little things out there that, you know, kind of I think make a really, really special personal gift as opposed to right. picking up the stupid get Iva box in the department store. <laughs> <laughs> so, Megan, let's bring you into the discussion. Uh, what were some of the most striking things for you as you began tasting fine flavored chocolate in comparison to mass produced chocolate? Yeah, so I think the most striking thing to me was just the flavors. Like, I was thinking about the holiday mix that everyone kind of gets of the little mini bars of like Mr. Good Bar and that kind of stuff. And, you know, everyone eats the peanut ones and the Rice Krispie ones and all that and leaves the plain chocolate because <laughs> it doesn't taste that good by itself. And so for me, it was really striking to try chocolate bars that actually just plain old chocolate bars, chocolate and sugar, tasted so amazing. And beyond that, it was um, that each one tasted so different. Like the flavors from a bar from Madagascar tasted, or from with chocolate from Madagascar, tasted so different than what you'd get from Nicaragua or something like that. And seeing how the makers kind of celebrated those flavor profiles instead of masking them behind sugar and other stuff too, and over roasting. So that that part was pretty cool for me. Right. Um, and the, so the stories that you published so far as part of Chocolate Noise have really been a very in-depth look inside chocolate makers like Rogue Chocolatier, Dandelion Chocolate, you mentioned all the other ones. Um, so you've really been in the trenches with them, so to speak. So what have you learned about chocolate makers that might help consumers when they're deciding what chocolate to buy? Yeah, so first off, they are a very passionate bunch. They spend all of their time and energy and money sourcing really high quality um, cacao beans and also working with farmers directly. A lot of them like fly to all over uh, the world and work with them and um, you know share their profits with them. For example, Taza and Askinosi, two uh, companies I've written about, share their profits with their farmers and actually have open books where the farmers can see all of their financial information, which is pretty cool. So they're really dedicated to that, you know, not only their local communities and making high quality food for their local communities, but also creating like a, a really positive global um, community and economy too. And then I think the other thing that's been so striking to me is all of the machines that they use to, to make the chocolate. And you don't really think about that as a layperson, but um, especially when a lot of these guys started, their 
weren't machines for small scale chocolate makers. So they had to make them themselves. And so there are all these kind of crazy DIY things with duct tape that they've, you know, <laughs> strung together that they're using and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and it's really amazing kind of the engineering that goes into it and, and all of that thought process too that, um, you know, it's, they're troubleshooting every day. I always think they're kind of like car mechanics but with chocolate, like, you know, all over their hands and stuff as they're fixing the machines. It's so true. That's, that's been great it's true. to learn more about. It's really complicated. I'm sure a lot of people, you know, if you haven't been in it in the way that you have, maybe haven't been exposed to all of the different aspects of the process to end up with a chocolate bar. Um, what do you think yeah. some of the biggest misconceptions um, are that consumers might have about craft chocolate makers and, and flavored chocolate? Yeah, so to me it goes back to what you were saying about the difference between a chocolatier and a chocolate maker. And I think it's really hard when you're looking at a package, um, you know, whether it's at a specialty store or a grocery store or whatever, or even, you know, their, uh, you know, a package of truffles, it's hard to tell what's going on there. Like, did they get the chocolate from another big maker or did they make it themselves? And I, so I, I think, and a lot of people don't even know to ask that question or even think about it as two separate skills. Um, so I think that's one of the main things that people are always really confused by. Um, because craft can mean so many things too. And it could mean, you know, that they made the chocolate themselves or that they took high quality chocolate and turned it into this amazing truffle or bonbon. So I think that's where a lot of the confusion comes in. Um, and I think just kind of the terms Jessica was talking about before too, like, you know, cacao percentage and country of origin and all that kind of stuff is helpful but also confusing when you are just kind of coming into it. Mm -hmm. And you say in your intro to Chocolate Noise that chocolate is transforming from a kid's sweet into an artisan luxury food. So what advice would you give to consumers who are just starting to explore this new world of craft chocolate? Yeah, I think to just not be afraid of it and like what you like um, and to go out and try things and you don't have to think that you have have to have this amazing palette in order to enjoy it. Um, you, it's, it's really cool to try different chocolates against each other and say like, you know, I really like that one or, you know, this one didn't really strike me and you don't have to be an expert or, you know, a wine connoisseur or a chocolate connoisseur to be able to enjoy it. Um, but I think, uh, you know, you can also kind of look for different measures to help you figure out what to enjoy, like Jessica was talking about the countries of origin, or, or maybe it was you actually saying, you know, maybe you like end up liking chocolate from Ecuador, and you'll figure that out if you right. just start trying it and, you know, eating it, and I think also tasting it in a different way than you would eat a Hershey's bar or something like that, kind of slowing down and savoring it, enjoying each bite can help a lot. But, um, you know, you never know what you're going to end up liking. Like one thing that I found that I really like recently is the dark milk chocolate that a lot of the makers are making. And I know that kind of blows everyone's mind if they're not in this world. Like, well, how could something be dark and milk chocolate? Because we always think of them as two separate categories. But um, I don't know. Maybe you'll like that. Maybe you'll find you like some of the really milky chocolates or the really 85% dark chocolate. I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. It's true. A lot of makers are coming out with dark milk chocolates and, you know, in the hand of a skilled chocolate maker, it's a completely different experience than eating, you know, just a, a regular milk candy bar. It's, again, you know, the depth the depth of flavor that you get um, and the craftsmanship and, yeah, I, I personally love dark milk as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, so your most recent story was about Soma Chocolate Maker in Toronto, um, and they proved that fine flavor chocolate is not just for bars. So talk a little bit about what um, grabbed you in the ways that they've expanded their scope of chocolate products. Well, first of all, I have not been there, but it seems like it's just a like wonderland for chocolate, where you walk in and there are cookies and gelato and chocolate bars and bonbons and it's just amazing um, all the, the different things that they have and I love that they use their high quality chocolate you know in other concoctions I guess in everything and in particular I thought it was cool that they um, you know they have these really amazing single origin chocolates but then they they pay attention to the flavor profiles in those and use those flavors to create a truffle kind of based on that single origin chocolate 
Um, and they even do it with the shape of the truffle um, because uh, Cynthia, who's one of the co-owners, is actually an architect by training. So I'm thinking in particular they have this olive oil truffle that's very long and tall and elegant and kind of like the olive oil that's in it and the chuao chocolate that they use to make it. So I thought that was kind of cool how they've um, kind of transformed the chocolate into all these different shapes and flavors um, using the original flavor profile. Right. I'm lucky enough to be in Toronto, so I have been there, and it is like that. It is like a wonder of <laughs> chocolate. Yeah. And they have a totally, um, they have open work areas in a lot of their stores, so you can actually see what's happening. And uh, actually, once when I was there, there were these two little kids, maybe one was two and one was four, and they were actually standing there pressing their faces up against the, the window. <laughs> 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 I took a picture yeah. and put it on our Instagram. It was just so yeah. cute. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so let's move on now to talking about bonbons, those tiny works of art created by chocolatiers. Um, Igrani, you definitely understand that fine flavor chocolate is not just for bars. Through your experience as a grand jury judge for the International Chocolate Awards, you've tasted a lot of fine flavor bars, but also a lot of fine flavor bonbons. Could you tell us a little bit about your journey in learning to evaluate and appreciate a fine flavor bonbon? Yeah, um, I started, I guess, on the other side, which was actually in the kitchen. So I worked as a chocolatier for a couple of years. And, um, you know, prior to that, I would kind of made chocolates at Christmas. Um, and, you know, they were good, but there's definitely, there's a lot of technique that kind of goes unseen that goes on in the professional kitchen from uh from product development, like if you think about the inside of a truffle, uh, you want that to be really nice and smooth and not grainy. You want it to kind of melt at a good pace and not leave a slick on your on your mouth. But as a chocolatier, you're also thinking about shelf life. You want this to be nice and fresh for your customer. How long is that going to be fresh for? Um, what kind of chocolate are you using on the inside? What kind of chocolate are you using on the outside? Um, and so there's just, you know, I learned a lot in the kitchen and as I've moved out of the kitchen and become more of a taster, I've seen a lot of um, crazy experiments and that work really, really well and, and where people clearly have skill and have spent a lot of time perfecting this like teeny little piece that most people just pop in their mouths and don't even think about. But the hours that go into that, that piece and really appreciating the work and um, research, really it's research that goes into it, um, is astonishing. So there is, there is a ton of work into what looks like a fairly simple you know, little candy or piece of chocolate that you just stick in your mouth and don't really think about. Right. Um, and so you've kind of started to allude to my next question, which is, uh, while well, sure. craftsmanship is, is really important in a chocolate bar, it's even um, more complicated and important in a little tiny bonbon. So what should we look for when it comes to high quality craftsmanship in uh, a fine flavor bonbon? Um, that's a great question. So one of the first things and one of the easiest things you can do is actually go into the shop um, and just look at the selection. Um, I've been to a lot of shops where you kind of look at everything looks really pretty but then you look a bit closer and say if it's a molded chocolate there's little like air bubbles in the corners or some of the pieces are a little bit bashed up. Or if you look sometimes at truffles, they'll have what a chocolatier calls a, a big foot, which is when you dip or enroll the chocolate, um, there's too much chocolate on the top of it and it hasn't drained properly and it kind of like puddles like at the bottom and it's called a foot. And all of these things, I mean, of course you want to know what it tastes like, but to me, if a chocolatier is taking care to make sure it looks good, that, that speaks to the level of detail that's going on in that operation. So if I go into a shop and things don't all look consistent, if they've all got big feet, that makes me wonder what other corners did you cut? So that to me is a really good indicator. Um, whenever I buy chocolates, I take them home and I cut them all in half. Like I sit there with a plate and I'll take a knife and I'll cut them in half and I'll actually like pick them up and look at them. And what I'm looking for is a really thin shell you really want that shell, the purpose of that shell is really to just keep the inside together. It's not, you're not really supposed to taste it or, or to feel it, I guess. Like it's, it's meant to complement the, the center, really. So um, you want to make sure there's a really nice thin shell. If it's a really thick shell, what will happen is the, the center will be gone and you're kind of like got this chocolate in your mouth. And hopefully it's nice chocolate, but that's kind of not the point. It's supposed to be this kind of like 
all-in-one kind of experience. I also pick up chocolates and I look at the bottoms because sometimes they haven't been sealed properly, sometimes they're cracked, sometimes they're not completely covered. Um, and again, it's, it's attention to detail, but it's also a food safety issue. So if those shells are cracked, you're going to get air or water inside, and that, ch that chocolate is not going to last as long. Um, and again, it's, it's kind of that whole package. Like I'm looking for a chocolatier who, A, identifies that those things shouldn't be in their case. Um, and, and, you know, should really be taking them out if those, if, if they're showing up because you should not be presenting product that isn't, isn't up to par. Um, and of course there's flavor, right? So, you know, you do want to taste it. You want to make sure that the fillings are nice and smooth. They shouldn't really be grainy. Um, and that they should taste like what they taste like. So, you know, a lot of people will give you the map and say, oh, this is a lemon, this is a mint, whatever. You really should be able to put that in your mouth and say, that's a lemon, that's a mint. Like, you shouldn't really need the map to tell you what you're tasting. And if you do, that's kind of a problem. So, um, you know, flavor, texture, and visual, really. Just, just check for those details. That's perfect. You've given, I think, people a lot of information to... to, to um to know what to look for when they're shopping. That's, that's mm -hmm. perfect. Um, as consumers, we tend to think about flavor first and foremost, um, but texture also plays a huge role in the overall experience. What have you learned about the importance of both flavor balance and texture over the years that you've been judging? Um, I found it's really hard to hit that sweet spot. So Pam, some people do texture really well, some people do flavor really well. Um, to get them both in the same piece is actually kind of challenging. Um, and it, it's a formulation thing. It's actually really tricky for a chocolatier to manage to do that because the firmer your filling is, sometimes the, um, the more assertive you can do flavors. Um, a softer filling can sometimes be a little bit sweeter. There's actually there's a ton of stuff um, that you're playing with there. Um, and so I find generally that it, it's really just tasting, like I'll go into chocolate shops and just get a couple of pieces and just taste them, be like, hmm, you know, how is this? Is this too sweet? Is this, is this really bitter? Have they chosen the right chocolate? Does it taste like what it's supposed to taste like? Mm -hmm. um, and if I find a chocolatier who kind of hits all those things, then I'll kind of stay there and I'll, I'll hang out there because I feel like that chocolatier has done the work um, that they should do. Um, and other chocolatiers, you taste it and like they're using poor quality chocolate. Uh, ganache is too firm. Sometimes it's grainy. So that's a really common flaw is that you'll have a grainy or sometimes a broken ganache if you bite into it and it looks like um, almost like frosting sometimes separates. If it looks like that, that's a broken ganache, you know, that's that's not cool either. Um, and I'm generally looking for something that's not super sweet as well. Like I want the flavor of the chocolate. It's funny because, you know, chocolate's the main ingredient, and people make a lot of fuss over, you know, the flavors that you're putting into it, but you should also be able to taste the chocolate, and it should be good quality chocolate that you would want to eat on its own as well. Um, so, yeah, kind of shop around and, and see who you like because chances are if, if somebody does, you know, a couple of pieces well, they're probably going to have that same attitude toward the rest of their collection, and, and then there's a lot of room to explore. Right. There's so many interesting flavor combinations that are being used in bonbons now. Can you talk a little bit about some of the successful flavor combinations you've come across, and maybe some of the unsuccessful ones, and why they didn't work as well? Sure. Um, I mean, bonbons are one place where you can really play. Like, I love cracked chocolate, and I sort of think of that as, like, the serious chocolate where you put your thinking cap on and it, you know, quiet room, uh, which is not to say it has to be serious, but, you know, bonbons, you can kind of go crazy. So I think about a uh, shop in Vancouver here called Beta 5, and a couple of years ago at the International Chocolate Awards, they won a gold for a fisherman's friend truffle, which is wacky, right? Like, there's no way that that should work, but it kind of came across as this, like, minty, menthol-y, chocolatey thing. And the reason it worked was, A, they had really excellent techniques, so really beautiful thin shells. The ganache was really nice and soft. Um, and then, but the flavor of it, they picked the right chocolate. They picked the right chocolate to go against that kind of menthol-y weirdness, and it all just kind of worked. Um, there's a chocolatier in Japan called S. Koyama who plays with savory. So he does like a milk chocolate, and he put like a fermented soybean on it, which should not work, but it totally worked. It was the sweet, salty, savory thing. Um, and I don't want to put all the emphasis on the weird flavors because I love a well-made caramel. I think like a plain chocolate ganache, if you're using really great chocolate, just a plain single origin is awesome. Coffee, you know, classic flavors also work really well. I think where people sometimes fall down is 
often with those wacky flavors. We kind of get wrapped up into, you know, oh, it's weird, it's unusual. Well, that doesn't mean it's good, you know? So it's fine to play around there and to be innovative and try new things, but you need to feed it to people who aren't your friends and family and who maybe aren't even, you know, who don't, who don't see your face. Because often I get like, oh, we tried this at the farmer's market and people loved it. Well, that's because at the farmer's market, people don't want to be mean to your face. Right? So you do need to test things with people who are going to give you an objective opinion and say, you know that, like, that blue cheese bacon um, orange zest thing? Don't don't sell that, you know? So, yeah. Okay. That's still yeah. like flat chocolate in general, I think, too. You know, it's like, look what I made, and, well, you know, <laughs> not my opinion. Yeah, friends and family are awesome, but you do need to test outside that that circle of of tasters for sure. Right, outside people who love you. Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, so you've touched on this a little bit, but just in case there's anything else you want to add for people that are going to be buying a box of fine flavor bonbons from a chocolatier as part of their holiday gift giving, um, what should they look for? I think the first thing that they should look for is freshness. So you want to either, if you're, say, buying um, online, you want to look online or maybe call them and say, you know, what's the shelf life of your products? And if the answer is more than two weeks, I would probably not shop there because chocolates, bonbons, they're designed to be fresh. If they're made with proper cream and they're made with fresh ingredients, they shouldn't really last more than two weeks, which is not to say they're not safe to eat. That's different, but they're not going to be optimal after two weeks. Uh, there are some exceptions. If you've got, you know, a, a really boozy truffle, that'll last longer. But that should be the exception and not the rule. Um, I would also let them know if you're going to be shipping, um, either ask the chocolatier if they can ship it for you because they'll probably be more adept at that with putting ice packs or whatnot. Um, or if you're going to ship it, then let whoever know, like whoever's packing that box, let them know, because sometimes chocolates jiggle around in a box, and they can sort of pat it a little bit so that your chocolates don't get bashed. Mm -hmm. um, of course, if you're sending, say, to New York, that may be less of a problem. If you're sending to Florida, that's another issue. So, you know, you always want to be thinking about shipping. Um, I often will tell people, you know, if you're sending chocolates to somebody who doesn't live in the same city as you, maybe there's a chocolatier in that city who you can give chocolate who you can buy chocolates from so that you will get a fresher chocolate as well it's not going to spend a week in the mail mm -hmm. um, and then finally I would look at a place that has pretty high turnover so it should be making chocolates regularly they should constantly be fresh they should not be things that are sitting on the shelf like oh yeah our chocolates last for a year don't buy those those no those are not going to make you happy <laughs> Right. Yeah, I know. I think those are all really good points, particularly the point about freshness in terms of, you know, what you can find in the grocery store is probably full of things that you maybe don't want to eat that keep them fresh for that long. So, yeah. and, you know, they're probably less expensive, but, you know, we're really looking at the quality and the craftsmanship, and, and that's really what you're paying for. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. So the next question is for all three of you. Um, with the holidays coming, many people like to give chocolate as a gift. So what's your favorite chocolate to give as a gift for a special occasion? Jessica, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I, I, don't, I don't like favorites because, you know, you love things for different reasons. Um, but I think there's a lot of really good options, especially this year, you know. Um, like I was saying, I, I, can, I can show you a few things. Um, I kind of want to, this is, this is from Nicole Trutanik of Bar Chocolat. This is hand-wrapped gift, you know, a hand-wrapped gift that she, she made. It's two bars inside. She also does three bars that are wrapped. Um, I think it's really special when you find something like that. You can get some swag, like a ritual t-shirt, um, some books. Um, Igrani's chocolate tasting kit. Um, on my website, I have a page, on the Bar Cacao website, I have a page called Choco Lit. And so, you know, and it indicates some books for people who like to read, and that can help them explore. Um, uh, George Bernardini came out with the chocolate, chocolate, the reference standard. I call it the chocolate encyclopedia. You know, getting a, giving somebody a book like that can be a lot of fun for people to get started on exploring. It gives some, you know, it can kind of give you some footing, and it's good for you know anybody from a beginner to somebody totally obsessed like I am. Um, 
I wanted to show you a couple of fun, like, limited release bars. Dick Taylor has a limited release bar out right now. You know, the guys from, from Fruition, Brian Graham of Fruition, just came out with Bourbon Girl Milk Chocolate and this funky new packaging. And Art over at Amano has his new packaging out for um, his limited release bars. And any of those kinds of things I think are really fun. Oh, um, Dick Taylor has this cool ginger snap bar that's coming out too. I think it's just adorable. It's going to have ginger snaps and dark chocolate. Um, so there's just so many fun things this year in particular. Um, and I think it's just going to keep getting better and better every year um, as people kind of up their game and as people get really, more and more people get excited about the craft chocolate movement. Great. Awesome. And Megan, what do you like to give as a gift? Yeah, so Jessica reminded me that there's a book I really love uh, by Mort Rosenblum just called Chocolate, and it's actually like this great narrative story of chocolate kind of from the beginning of time all the way till like I think the early 2000s, and it's just a really great read. But if you want to actually eat something delicious, um, there's so many bars to choose from, so many good stuff. But I think my favorite right now that I like to give people as a gift is kind of going back to what I was saying about dark milk chocolate blowing people's minds is... Um, the Marignan Milk Bar by uh, Fruition Chocolate. That one just really kind of opened my eyes. And actually, Jessica is the one who gave that to me first a long time ago when it was, uh, when it was still developing. Yeah. Um, and then kind of like a longtime favorite that's more kind of a candy but that I, I love is the Pralu Infinity Bars. And they have like their um, pistachio one in particular is so good. And it's like a very thick candy bar filled with um, ganache and it's just amazing and I think my mom bought like four in New York last time I saw her <laughs> so um, they're always good to have around and good to give us presents everyone oh that sounds love. amazing yeah. <laughs> and, and Granny what about you what do you like to give um, well this was everybody pretty much got one of these <laughs> um, so That's shameless plug um, goes well with with a collection of chocolate bars, um, but uh, I'll, I'll play the Canadian card. So you know, if somebody gave me Soma, I would be so happy. Soma also does these chocolate covered corn nuts. Sounds ridiculous. So addictive. I have to hide them from myself and my husband because otherwise I'll just eat the entire bag at once. Um, local chocolate maker uh, in Victoria called Serene. Who, I don't have a package in front of me. Jessica, do you have one? I, I can be back in 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> it's bright yellow, and he does um, he does pairings. So he does one Madagascar and one Ecuador. So it's awesome as a gift to give somebody who's just learning about fine chocolate because you get two different origins in one package. And visually, they're very different. Flavor-wise, they're very different. And it just really drives home that point of, oh, okay, this is... These are different, aside from the fact that, there we go, um, it's also excellent chocolate. Um, and, yeah, I think, uh, what else? I'm, I'm also kind of a sucker for Michael Ricutti's Peppermint Patties. Um, so kind of that, like, nostalgia thing. Um, so every time I'm in San Francisco, I grab one of those. I love the mint and chocolate, too. It's a delicious combination. Very yes. classic. Yep. <laughs> Um, and we've all kind of touched on this a little bit as we've been talking, but many chocolatiers and chocolate makers create special products for the holidays. So maybe classic fall flavors like cinnamon or ginger, or we, we know pumpkin spice is still is still making an appearance. Um, uh, and then we talked about mint for the winter holiday season. Um, does anyone have a favorite seasonal chocolate other than the ones I've mentioned? <laughs> I think I think I flew through uh, my my favorites. I'm a purist. I can't help it. You know, I don't I don't generally like stuff in my chocolate. But I would say, you know, there's plenty of fun stuff out there. Excellent. I really like Soma's. Um, this is available year round, but Soma makes a Peruvian dark chocolate with candied ginger in it, which I feel like is particularly good for winter time. So I love that one. And then any of the drinking chocolates. I mean, you know, Askinosi has a really amazing drinking chocolate. Soma, again, even Cacao in Portland, which isn't a maker but a store, they make their own blend that's really delicious too. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say just given the, the cold of the winter, anything with a little bit of heat is always kind of nice. At least where, where I am, it's a cold winter. Maybe things are different if you're in Florida with the Mai Tai. But, uh, yeah, I'll take a little bit of heat with my chocolate. Um, but like Jessica, I'm also a purist, so I, I do like my plain chocolate bars. But when it comes to drinking chocolate, you know, let's, let's make it warm and cozy. 
Right. I did think of one thing. I, I, I am a sucker for fruitions, brown butter, bourbon, caramels. There you have it. Generally not not my style, but you know it's bourbon and chocolate and and it wins. Yeah, <laughs> nice gift too. Absolutely. Well, ladies, this has been a great discussion. I just want to say thank you to all of you. Thank you to Jessica Ferrero of Bar Cacao, Megan Giller of Chocolate Noise, and Grani Yu, um, author of the Chocolate Tasting Kit and also the Well-Tempered Chocolatier, for taking time out of your busy day to join in our conversation and helping us uh, all to learn more about tasting fine chocolate. Um, if you know anyone who may have missed our live broadcast, we will be posting the video on our website, www.apolochocolat.com, shortly. Thank you so much to everyone for watching, and thank you to our panelists for joining us. Thank you, Alicia. I really appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Good, I'm glad.